And I'm going to go ahead and suggest that we get started. I just clicked record. Did you? You got it? Okay, good. All right. Um, I'm going to introduce introduce myself. I am the official host tonight. Uh, Kelly Roos is the name. I don't know. Can you see that or is it backwards? Backwards, right? Look at it in a mirror across the room, all right? This is my official pickup badge, all right? So you can call me Rooster, though. That's been my nickname all my life. Um, I'm one of the pickuppers, I guess you could say. And I'm going to introduce my co-host, uh, Larry Engelhart. Hello. He's the one with those fancy headphones on, waving right at the moment. All right. So we uh, uh, welcome. We we uh, looking forward to tonight. We thought we'd do something interesting. We've been conducting these online meetings once a uh, once a month or so uh, this year, and we 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 thought it'd be fun to get together uh, uh, some of uh, of you who have signed up for the uh, uh, faculty development workshop this summer, and have a chance to get a little glimpse into what uh, we're going to be doing. Uh, we thought it'd be even more fun to have some of the participants from last year's uh, come and uh, provide some words of wisdom. So the format we're going to do is, is have uh, the three of the participants from last year, Mich Michelle Cuchera. Michelle, can you hold your Miller light up again there? Do, do, something, do something interesting to make yourself front and center. You're not doing anything interesting, Michelle. Well, Michelle's here somewhere. And uh, also, uh, Todd Zimmerman. Todd, are you here? There's Todd waving. I don't know if you can see him. Um, I guess if you don't actually say anything, I think if you say something, if you unmute, then you can, uh, then your image gets plopped front and center there. Try it, Todd. Say something Hello. intelligent. Hello, everybody. There you go. Everybody okay. see Todd now. All right. Michelle, are you there? Unmute and say something. Hi. Did it work? Uh, well, hello, hello. <laughs> there we go. Is it gonna, <laughs> there we go. There's Michelle. And I don't see Hunter yet, but uh, Hunter, Hunter sent a message that he'll be joining momentarily. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. He'll be along shortly. All right. So now, um, one thing that tends to help the, uh, the operation uh, of these meetings is if you indeed stay muted until you get called on or until you want to, you just can't help yourself, but you got to bust into the conversation, all right? Um, so that usually works well to keep yourself muted and uh, keeps background noise out and it's easiest to hear the speakers, all right? So um, uh, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, Tony, uh, oh, Tony's the other one. I forgot to introduce Tony here. Tony, make a noise. How do y'all? There's Here's my, my name tag. Yeah, there's ah, there's Tony. Yeah, yeah, there there is, and uh, I forgot four. I guess we got four of you, don't we? Good. All right. So, um, who who wants to start? Uh, Tony, do you want to start? Sure. Okay. Well, so so, so why don't you go ahead and uh, uh, like I said, give us some words of wisdom, and then we'll go through uh, the other three. And I would suggest we'll open up for questions after our speakers are done. All right. And, and I, I could also make a, a suggestion. Um, if there are questions that come to you or thoughts that come to you while someone is speaking, there is a chat window. If you scroll over the video down at the bottom, you, there's a chat icon you can click on. And you can go ahead and type over in the chat window. So we'll have questions or comments that are, are there for um, when there's an opportunity. Yeah. So my name is Tony Musumba and I teach at Bismarck uh, State College. It's a two year college and I teach the introductory sequence of uh, physics, physics one, two, and I also teach college physics. And so uh, I've been doing computational, uh, integrating computational physics for a couple of years now. But I, I was, I knew uh, Kelly, Larry and the rest of the pickup guys. And so uh, I figured that when they, when they talked about the faculty development workshop, I, I already had an experience with them and I knew how uh, much wisdom Kelly had. And so I, I definitely signed on pretty early and I was uh, looking forward to this uh, workshop last year. The other thing, I hadn't been to Wisconsin, so I wanted to get to Wisconsin. Though I'm just in Bismarck, North Dakota, but I figured, why not go out and see the Parkers? Anyway, I'm kidding. But um, 
the other thing is, of course, when you go to these faculty development workshops, you want to connect with faculty. I am primarily a teaching faculty, and I want to hear what the research faculty are doing, what, how they're doing uh, integrating computation into their uh, upper level courses, even though I don't teach those upper level courses. So I like to interact with people and get to expand my horizons. Uh, so it was really a good time to be out there in Wisconsin and uh, interact with faculty and create activities that I might use in my classes. Uh, so on a, on a personal level, what did I achieve by being there? I guess you grow in the way you, you look at how you integrate computation. There were, I was exposed to a couple languages that I hadn't really used. And I must say, I wasn't planning on using them, but that exposure just helps you also in your professional development. I, I did uh, work on an activity that I was gonna use in my undergraduate courses. I never really published it and it's not publishable yet, but I started on that activity and use it. The one big thing also that I learned from the uh, faculty development is to think seriously about your learning goals. So I hadn't really thought seriously and critically about how, why I'm doing computation and why I want my students to actually do this computational uh, stuff that I was doing, the activities that I was doing. How were they mapping on to uh, uh, learning outcomes and stuff like that? So that's the first time that I have seriously thought about what I'm doing computationally and how my students are supposed to actually uh, do these activities and eventually get the outcomes that I'm expecting. So that was a big thing for me. Uh, I also picked up Slack. I, when I came to uh, the workshop, I hadn't quite started using Slack, but I had read a, a chemistry magazine that uh, talked about researchers using Slack in their labs for, for collaboration. So when uh, Danny came up with the Slack idea, I jumped on it. I wasn't very, I, I didn't post a lot of stuff, but I emailed a couple of people, I talked direct messages. And when I went back to Bismarck, lo and behold, I had a whole bunch of Slack groups that I created, some for clubs, some for my classes. And I've been very active on Slack and the collaboration has been really great for me. Uh, so I guess uh, I must say that Go Pickup has been the most active Slack that I've been involved in, Slack group that I've been involved in, or Slack team. And uh, I've kind of maintained contact with people that I went uh, to the workshop with and some other new people that I've met over the, over the course of last year. The, the one thing that started off in uh, the workshop itself, the faculty development workshop, was thinking about what what could happen if I had a computational community among uh, North Dakota and Minnesota? So I basically sent out an email during the workshop and I said, would you guys be interested in us doing a computational workshop? And I'm happy to tell you that we actually had one this last April and it was a very successful computational workshop. And hopefully we'll follow up on, on the stuff that we're doing here. That's about all I had. I'm glad to meet you guys all. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Tony. Uh, let's see, next up, how about Michelle? But before, before Michelle, could I uh, follow on yeah, one thing that Tony said? Um, uh, so everyone should have received an invitation via email in the last half an hour, um, inviting you to the pickup Slack team. And that's what Tony was just talking about. So feel free to accept that invitation. Um, and you also were invited to specifically join a channel within that pickup Slack team devoted to the faculty development workshop 2017. Um, and by all means, feel free to ask more questions about that. Okay, that's all. Yeah. Good. Okay, Michelle, are you ready? I'm ready. All right, you've got that beer polished off? <laughs> Not quite yet. Oh, all right. Okay, so I'm Michelle Cuchera. I am a new faculty member at Davidson College, which is a small liberal arts college uh, near Charlotte. And um, so I attended the workshop last summer um, coming into my first year uh, in a tenure track position. So, um, so I didn't really know what to expect the following year, but the workshop was still incredibly useful. And I think that one of the greatest things that I took away was resources. And one of those um, is the Slack channel. 
Um, so Slack is incredibly useful. Um, another one is the community of faculty who have similar goals um, to you. And also you're introduced to a lot of uh, resources where you can find uh, exercises that people developed, but also resources like uh, I didn't know about Trinket, which if you don't know about, I assume you will learn about at the workshop, um, and different ways to use languages that I knew. Um, so it was incredibly useful. And I guess I should say that um, I'm a computational physicist and so my research is all computation based. So it wasn't that I was learning like Python for the first time, but I was learning how to use Python in new, um, in new ways. Um, so some of the kind of tips that I wrote down is first, you should have some idea about your fall course material before going. So when you're at the workshop, you can frame what you're learning in terms of something that you can implement when you get back home. And um, so, uh, so that may be just knowing what courses you're teaching and, and being able to frame what you're learning in the context of an actual assignment or lab, depending on how you want to integrate things um, uh, that will be applicable right away. Um, in addition, I think that you will quickly realize that there's no one solution to integrating computation into your curriculum. Um, a lot of people come from a lot of different backgrounds. Um, for example, I'm at a small liberal arts college, so, um, so my class sizes are a lot smaller. Um, maybe I have some, some flexibility and freedom that other people don't have, um, but maybe I also have other barriers that people don't have. Um, and also realizing that people have different learning goals for why they want to integrate computation. So, um, so you aren't going to get like a list of notes of how to go back and integrate computation uh, into your classes or like into your department because people have different restrictions and different goals. So um, I think those are important things. Um, lastly, I think the collaboration and the people that you meet um, is so incredibly important there. So just with talking to some folks that I just met, we all had similar interests. Um, I had just mentioned some idea that I had in the back of my mind about having some sort of physics hackathon at my college. And I got so much support from the other faculty um, at the workshop that we ended up, um, that I ended up coming back and putting together a campus-wide event that we, um, that we hosted this semester. So uh, I don't think I would have done that without the support of my colleagues at the workshop. I'm all done. All right. Thank you, Michelle. Um, uh, uh, Todd, do you want to go next? Uh, Hunter has disappeared. So why don't you go next and we'll see if Hunter comes back. Sure. I think I'm going to move into a different room now, so nah. there's no crying baby <laughs> in the background. <laughs> uh, I'm Todd Zimmerman, and I am a faculty member at UW-Stout, which is... Um, just down the road from River Falls, and I'll actually be helping out uh, this summer, so I'll get to meet some of you in person. Um, I went to the workshop uh, last summer, and um, so what Michelle and Tony had said, I would kind of reiterate a lot of those things. Um, I think the two things I would add, first off, having devoted time just to work on these projects makes a huge difference. You know, you have all these ideas throughout the school year, and having several days where you're forced to sit there and just work on these things is a wonderful experience. I would not have gotten as much done um, without that. And you know, the other thing is um, there are people there that have a lot of experience getting these things to work. And so it was so nice, um, you know, especially Danny um, and some of the other people there who have worked with Trinket, they've worked with uh, VPython. And so just having them there to troubleshoot um, and tell you all the little tricks and tips. Um, and also seeing what's possible. Um, so I think there's a lot of uh, good things that come out of this and uh, I look forward to seeing a lot of you this summer. And that's it for me. Okay, thank you, uh, Todd. Um, Hunter must be having troubles and if he should show up, we'll have him address us, all right? So that is everybody so far. And I think at this point, 
we will open it up to any questions you have. Um, and Paul did post a question in the chat window if you wanted to, um, to jump in, Paul. Yeah, um, St. Mary's is a, is a teaching institution and um, a lot of what we do involves service courses, both for uh, non-science uh, majors and for biology majors. And I'm wondering um, what, ex I've, I've talked to uh, Nathan Moore over at uh, Winona State and uh, I think I think it's probably fair to say that his attempt to do Python programming, for example, in an undergraduate, say, calculus-based physics laboratory has been, that his experience with that has been mixed. So I was wondering if if people had experience with that resistance. I'm particularly interested in Davidson. I think uh, Davidson is probably several tiers above us uh, in terms of uh, the quality of students that, that enroll at, at Davidson. Um, so I was just wondering what what people's experience was in attempting to get non-majors and even biology majors to program. Thanks. I can definitely speak to that being from Davidson. Um, so I do think that, that I, I have a unique crew of students and I can tell you my experiences with it, but I think that, um, that I should outline my learning goals for when I implemented computation in my um, calc-based intro course last semester that we had pre-med, bio, chem majors, that sort of thing. So my goal there was, um, was I, I essentially, I flat out told the students, you aren't going to learn to program. Don't be afraid that you're looking at code. And I implemented, I implemented, um, uh, so I implemented computation in the classes specifically inside of the labs and I did that only because that's where I had wiggle room <laughs> to do it so uh, we just cover so much material uh, in class time that I didn't have time to sit down with them and I could sit there and they wouldn't be stuck working on a or stuck on a bug in their homework for you know way too much time because my goal for them was to use computation to understand the concepts better. So um, I did it with, with um, trinkets and Jupyter notebooks. And I think the trinket was the most successful because we could have been embed it right into our, um, our uh, LMS, our Moodle is what we use. And I could ask them specific questions about it. So I would provide, um, Python code and specifically V Python because I wanted them to visualize what they were doing. Um, I would give them code and then I would ask them to change certain things. And so maybe it's a working, it was always a working code that I gave them. And then I'll say, okay, change the sign of the charge, but they'd have to look in the code and figure out where the charge was being allocated and change it. So I told them they wouldn't have to learn the code, but yet they're still learning that logical thinking. Um, but I never asked them to code anything from scratch. Um, probably the biggest surprise for me uh, of doing that last semester was um, I received no negative feedback uh, from the computation, integrating the computation into the lab course, um, which I assume somebody <laughs> would be unhappy with that. And that wasn't the case, but we always did it in lab with me there to help them. I have a quick follow-up question, Michelle. Um, uh, so when you were describing how you had them kind of play, it sounded a little bit like play with some of the parameters within the code uh, and see how that affects the outcome, right? Uh, would you uh, then compare that a little bit with like what some instructors do with regards to like the um, uh, the applets that are used like coming out of Colorado Boulder like were you kind of using it in that context 
So if I'm thinking about, so first of all, were you at Michigan State? Yes. I was a postdoc there. I think you were graduating. Yes. It's been okay. a while, but hello. Sorry. Hi. I'm like, wait, I know you. Okay. Um, can you ask me a question again? I'm sorry. Yeah. So uh, the way you were describing how it sounded you were using the uh, like trinket in your intro labs was to uh, build more understanding with the lecture material. And that sounds how uh, I've heard some faculty at various places use like some of the uh, applets coming out of places like Boulder where the code is obvious, but it's uh, uh, they can input directly different parameters, like with the ideal gas case, they'll change the pressure and they'll see these things change. Is the, maybe you're not that familiar with those. I just mentioned that because they're- No, so I think, I think what you're talking about are applets where you aren't interacting with the code, right? Right. FETs in particular you're talking about, right? Yeah. Yes, that's, that's the term I was searching for, yes. Here, Thank which you. are similar. Yeah, so I'm familiar with the FETs and the FISLETs, and this is, I, I consider, so the reason that I'm doing what I'm doing, which is I'm giving them the code side by side with, um, with the, the animation or uh, interactive simulation, because I want them actually to make lists and, um, and edit and run code maybe create a bug themselves and fix it. So, um, so even though I'm telling them that they don't have to learn to code and to them maybe it is similar to working with a FET or a FISLET, I have like my secret learning goal for them, which is to become familiar with computation um, and understand that logical thinking that goes into, uh, into changing the actual code to meet certain to, to meet my, you know, requests. So it's, it's, it's in some ways, it's a, it's not computation qua computation, it's computation qua algorithmic thinking. Yes, and that's specifically for the intro classes, I would say, um, because in the upper level classes, I would expect them to know numerical methods and algorithms and know how to specifically code from scratch. Oh, that, 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 that's helpful, thanks. I, I, I've used the, the, the PHET simulations a lot and have written sort of homework sets based on, or laboratory experiences based on those but it's it's much more it's much more an appliance than it is an actual experience of the coding because i'm kind of conflicted whether whether it's legitimate for me to say um you know it's it, this learning goal is appropriate for this class at this level. So maybe I can jump in and uh, talk about my experience. I, so I teach at a two-year college and sometimes people think two-year colleges, students are pretty weak, but that's usually not the case. Some of the guys who come to take engineering are pretty uh, strong students. Uh, they just kind of come to Bismarck State College while they wait to go to North Dakota State University or uh, University of North Dakota. So I have, uh, I started off with baby steps and that's almost like four years ago. I had been exposed to the work that Pickup does uh, through one of the guys in California and I started kind of using baby step and throwing in a computational activity or two a semester, and then I, I experienced the resistance that uh, you're talking about. But I mean, I, I was always constantly looking at what is it I'm doing right or wrong. Uh, and then I realized that, I mean, if you're gonna throw in a little computation here and a little computation there without any thread, then you're gonna have trouble. So I kind of dove in or, or I, I decided I was gonna use modern interactions as a curriculum two years ago, and this is when I had been using computation for a couple activities a semester. And I found that the resistance is always gonna be there, uh, but you're gonna outlive your students somehow. 
So <laughs> what I mean is that uh, when you're a new faculty, you experience a lot more resistance. But when your students uh, know that this is what they're going to do, you kind of, they eventually get to understand uh, the reason why you're doing that. Uh, of course, the, the one thing that Michelle mentioned was that there are different flexibilities and different barriers. Well, my flexibility is that I have a three-hour lab. That's a, that's a huge chunk of time. You can do computational stuff, and you can also actually do a lab. And uh, then I meet with these students who are only 20, not more than 20, and uh, you, you can also make, make it such that they code together as a group of three or a group of four so that it's not too challenging for you moving around trying to troubleshoot code all the time. Uh, so those are a couple of things that you can do. And I can also say about the college physics, I, I tried once to, do, to, inter, to, inter, to integrate computation in one of my classes, and it worked out pretty well. But I, I thought that, that year there was a very special students of college physics, uh, uh, very special students who were able to actually take it uh, take, take computational uh, activities quite quickly. And I, I did not replicate it again, but I would like to actually do computational activities with uh, college physics, but I'm thinking I would rather use Excel or something else. And that's something I can talk to Kelly about who's done that quite a bit. Uh, does that help in some way, shape or form? What? It, it helps me to, to a certain extent. I, I don't want to over dominate the discussion here, but um, I'm just thinking that um, it's difficult to, um, at, at, for example, let me, let me give you an example. We, we teach a course in microcontroller architecture. Uh, for that's part of the instrumentation sequence for the physics majors. Uh, we used to teach that course before without without a, a programming prerequisite. In other words, they would walk in and they would uh, start programming an assembly language. Uh, it was a bit of a disaster, and so we instituted a programming requirement before it doesn't matter that the programming's in Python and that they're going to be doing uh, assembly language programming with the microcontrollers but it's the whole this is what I was getting at before this whole question of algorithmic thinking that that you think not theoretically or experimentally uh, or phenomenologically, that you think algorithmically. It's how can I put together a step-by-step -step algorithm to, um, to, to do this? And what Michelle, uh, I think, uh, I, I, I agree with you that eventually you want the majors to be doing something a little more sophisticated that you want them to start coding from scratch so that it's 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 not just algorithmic thinking but it's actual algorithmic application that they're actually coding so uh, i wonder what other people ex experiences Um, Looks like Larry is talking, but he's not. Yeah, let, I was going to. Larry, you're muted. Oh, I'm sorry. There I'm sorry. I, I actually, well, what I was saying, but you weren't hearing, was that uh, just pointing out that Hunter has joined uh, yeah. apparently from a cave in Texas. Uh, and so if you wanted to, to share uh, anything. Yeah, why don't we, why don't we go ahead and have Hunter. You, you ready, man? Yeah, I'm ready. Um, okay. So go ahead, and then we'll get back to it's, questions. It's a good time in the cave because the bats are out uh, eating dinner. So um, what, what is the prompt? What would you like me to... to um, we, we just want you to give us some words of wisdom. Okay. Um, 
So my words of wisdom. Speaking uh, words of wisdom, let it be. Right. We listened to that song earlier uh, <laughs> and during dinner with my kids. Um, I, uh, so I have, I guess my words of wisdom, just in case this wouldn't occur to anybody or to somebody, um, is to have a particular problem in mind to solve um, r- rather than to learn generally. and. And um, also, in case anyone doesn't have any experience programming, I think it'd be good to, to jump into something before you, you go to the workshop. Uh, because I, I think the way it's structured is that you, it's, there seems to be an assumption in the, in the structure of the workshop that you have an idea of what you're trying to tackle. Um, so um, I've definitely spent the whole year uh, since the workshop, stumbling forward and wrestling with a problem of how to, I mean, most of my experience, I guess, up, in, up until the workshop had been giving open-ended programming experiences to upper division physics students, um, but also like laying off in terms of the expectations, just saying, hey, I'm learning, you're learning, let's figure something out and you, you can make something cool. Um, but uh, what I've been wrestling with this year is figuring out how to create enough structure to sort of hold introductory students um, together while they encounter uh, computer programs for the first time. So I was thinking, uh, let's see, um, I don't think I know your name, but user NIE neighbor um, who was talking about algorithmic thinking What's your name? Paul, the neighbor. Paul, okay. So Paul was talking about algorithmic thinking and and my intuition has been um, not to engage students at the introductory level um, in algorithmic thinking, or rather not not, um, uh, tossing them any algorithmic thinking tasks and maybe I'm maybe I'm underestimating them, but my idea is to really try to prevent resistance um, by by providing them a lot of support w- with the assumption that that computer programming is a relatively intimidating situation for a lot of the students, and then I want to provide them relatively easy tasks. You know, mo- modify this parameter or write. So today I was, um, there was a free body diagram trinket. It was a static. There was a block being pushed on, like one, a person was pushing on one side, the person was pulling on the other side with a rope. There was a static friction force. And I was working with a student. We were designing the trinket together. And we were saying, okay, let's have the students write a formula for the, for the um, size of the force vector by the friction force that's in response to the person pushing and the, person pulling on the rope. So all I want them to do is to write, you know, um, axis equals minus, you know, force by Chris dot axis plus force by Pam dot axis. So they're, um, but we're going to write some comments into the code that say, for the axis of the friction force, replace the vector zero, zero, zero with a formula in terms of the axis of the other forces, you know, so we're, giving them kind of what, what are the terms that we're saying, put these Legos together into this slot in whatever way you think would work based on what you know about physics so far. Um, so it's, it's very far from um, suggesting to the students that they design an algorithm, but rather just that they, it's a lot of toe dipping. That is, this is my intuition. I don't know that it's right, um, but we're trying, we want to create a lot of um, toe dipping experiences for the students in the introductory mechanics course. So they just feel comfortable looking at code, finding a place to edit it, editing that, maybe writing a formula or writing, you know, some numerical things, getting a little bit used to some data types and that's it. You know, in terms of the, the goal, the way that we're conceptualizing it in our program, the goals for the introductory mechanics students, is just to get them some exposure, getting them looking at code and, and modifying it lightly. 
And then we've also added a, on the, um, after I came back from the workshop, we, we added a, a new course and, des, and have yet to seriously design it for next fall. But it's going to be a sophomore level um, intensive Python lab course for physics majors taught in the physics department um, using the Kinder and Nelson Introduction to Python for Physical Modeling book. Um, and that's the idea that, you know, you've had some exposure and now we're going to teach you really, um, you know, uh, in, a, in a deliberate way where you're really expecting you to learn specific things in this software level course. So that's my wisdom dump, such as it is. Thank, thank you, uh, uh, Hunter, for that dump, right? Um, I, I wanted to follow up real quick on something I saw happening in the chat. And uh, uh, Carol, do you want to maybe elaborate on on the uh, on your, your 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 comment, maybe slash question there about computation throughout the curriculum? Uh, what specifically is it you're you're interested in? The big picture is that what you're asking about? Um, I mean, I wasn't the first person to mention that. I was adding to the people who already had, but I can right, talk yeah. about my experience today. Uh huh. Um, so yeah, I am at Cal State um, San Bernardino, and uh, we are in an interesting position where we're getting ready to convert from quarters to semesters. So we have an opportunity to completely redesign, redesign our curriculum from the ground up. I think most people don't get that opportunity all at once to go through and through. So I mean, we've been talking about making like a computational class for our majors like Hunter was just talking about. And I've been dabbling and putting it in some courses that I've taught at the sophomore and junior level. Um, but since we have this opportunity to, to embed it and, and therefore reinforce it, even after that computational class, you know, I'm absolutely um, interested in hearing anyone's ideas or, or how they've done this in their department. Anybody want to tackle this one? Is the question, um, how would you integrate computation throughout the whole undergraduate program? That's one part of it, yeah. So um, more so just ideas of how people might address this if you had the opportunity to, or how people are already doing it. I'll add one word, which I put in the, the chat window uh, a little bit ago, uh, which I think goes along with a lot of things that Michelle was saying and hunters were saying and, and Tony and others um, of scaffolding for the computational exercises um, being very, very important um, and uh, having lots of scaffolding to start with and reducing that little by little um, over time. Um, I think it is an important thing um, and will be a, a big part of the, the workshop also. Uh, I'll make a, a comment here. Uh, so I taught, uh, so our, our department is semester based, uh, but nonetheless, uh, we just added a course to our major of computational physics and ours is a sophomore level class. Uh, but given the constraints of how few majors we have, like a lot of departments, uh, it's only an every other year course. Um, and the prereq for it is just uh, the intro mechanics course. Um, where, are you, where, where are you at? I'm at Gonzaga University in Spokane, Washington. So we have a physics major. It's a four-year right. bachelor's degree. Um, and uh, it was the first time this course was offered was when I taught it uh, last semester. So it's a new course for our major. And it's required for the major. Uh, but we have either sophomores or juniors. So it's not a prereq for our upper-level courses just out of, you know, practical – uh, thoughts on when students take our upper level courses. We don't even offer all of our courses every year. Sometimes it's every other year. So that's something that we're working through on trying to think of, well, how do we integrate this through our upper level curriculum? So we're still developing that a little bit. I know for us, the idea uh, is something like, well, if students get this idea of how numerical methods are used, algorithmic thinking, knowing how to use, uh, you know, if for while statements in a, in an applied sense, regardless of language, then the upper level course instructors can implement that uh, a little bit at their discretion. Uh, but I know for us at the moment, it's very uh, non-structured. And part of that is our realistic case of we can't, 
assume students take it like first semester sophomore year every year just because that's not realistic. So that's a real difficulty for us to try to uh, deeply integrate it. So I think realistically, we won't be able to deeply integrate it uh, into our curriculum uh, just because of how our prereqs have to work. And that's you know difficult, uh, but that makes it where when I'm thinking about what I want students to get out of that course, how portable the ideas and, and applications they're learning are, and I try to focus on the more portable aspects and less in the uh, specifics, I guess, if that, if that makes sense. I mean, that, that's one of the things I'm hoping to make progress on in the, in the workshop is getting some more ideas on how some other people do that. Like when I'm teaching it, I, I use Mathematica because we had licenses for it, so I didn't have to have students buy it, and it had you know, really nice built-in plotting, and I can do some of the programming inside, and I wasn't too concerned about the language. Uh, and I didn't want the students to have to pick up a whole language. Uh, and it was only a two hour course for us. So, you know, I mean, every department's gonna have those factors, but um, you know, with you switching from quarter to semester, that's exciting to think about how you can do that. Uh, but if you were able to get it where that class is offered every year and all the students always take it, say as sophomores, then you could have more flexibility and having it almost as a prereq for some of the upper level classes, right? Whereas for us, that's not, at the moment, how it's designed, that's not how it's implemented. How many uh, majors do you have, have uh, graduate per year, Adam? How many graduates per year? Yeah. Oh yeah, I mean, two to six. Okay. It's quite small. Yeah. We might have, uh, you know, that many or more minors, uh, but uh, like I had six students in my computational course and three were majors and three were minors. Well, at that operating at that volume, you also don't have to be quite as organized. I think you can do a lot more one-on-one -on -one coaching. Well, that's true. And like the pace was easier to set because if I thought we were going a little too fast, I could slow down very easily. You know, each student had their own computer uh, in the lab space. Um, so it's a very different uh, integration than what uh, some of you have mentioned with the introductory course sequence, integrating that either in the lecture or in the lab component. Um, I know like that, uh, in principle we could do that, but our lecturer and lab instructors are not the same people. They're separate courses. So then that gets complicated on, on integration. So uh, I'm a, uh, so Carol, I think that would be exciting with you switching uh, from your system because you have a real opportunity to think about how you want to do that. So right. I have we're spending a good year and a half on, on designing that. Sorry, I'll let whoever's next going. Oh, I was just going to make a comment, piggyback on that, um, kind of aimed at you, and that's that I don't know how many faculty are in your department, but if you're thinking about integrating computation throughout, um, I'm in a department that strongly supports integrating computation and undergraduate physics, and we still aren't at a consensus on how to do that. Um, and so, like, for example, you know, I teach a computational physics class required for physics majors at the sophomore level um, in Python, but they may then get an advanced mechanics professor who doesn't know Python, is not planning on learning it, and is going to use um, maybe MATLAB, which isn't so different, or Mathematica, which I think is significantly different. So you do have, I think, some challenges there if you have a larger department. Um, or even just the department where there's not a consensus on what people would like to use. If you'd like students to really um, uh, keep using their skills without having to learn a new language. Um, but I mean, you can still do it. I mean, we, we make do here, I would say. Um, and then the other thing that I want to bring up is when people are talking about integrating computation, into undergraduate physics curricula, I think that there are, I don't know if there's two approaches or just two ways that it works at colleges because of, and universities because of the scheduling, but some people have a computational physics class where you can like sit them down and give them a set of skills. And then other people don't have that luxury or choose not to do that and they're integrating it throughout. And I think that that's um, two very different ways of having to, implement it because you have to spend more time in the class talking about um, um, algorithms uh, and things like that if you don't specifically have a computational physics class. 
Shell, I just wanted to comment about your diversity of languages at the, at the upper division. I, um, we have the same situation where we don't have, you know, the faculty are not all on board with, um, you know, using Python at the upper division level. I mean, they may come to that conclusion, but right now our, our attitude is we're going to do exposure to Python, then we're going to do explicit instruction at the middle level on Python, which is, um, you know, people I trust say it's a, it's a good language to learn in. And then, you know, at the upper division level, there, it's at the instructor's discretion. The, the one thing, so I'm the director of the undergraduate program, and I, I won't pressure people to, to use a specific language, but I will, I will be willing to say, you know, that you have to have some computational activities in the class. And our attitude has just been, you know, that's, that's for the student to adapt to, you know, and good luck, and that that's reasonable. So, um, if I may just ask a question, um, my name is Axel Mellinger from Central Michigan University, and uh, it's the first time uh, for me at this meeting. Uh, does anyone have experience uh, uh, doing computations in lab courses that are taught by teaching assistants, because that's the situation that, that I'm facing. I'm coordinating the college and university physics lab courses, um, but uh, I'm usually not in the classroom. We, we have a total of between 12 and 15 sections, uh, university and college physics combined per semester, so obviously I, I can't teach all of those courses. Since no one else immediately uh, jumped in, um, I'll just point out that uh, another one of the pickup people who isn't here tonight but will be at the, the faculty development workshop this summer, uh, Danny Caballero from Michigan State, uh, he has a lot of experience with that and he teaches large introductory classes where TAs are doing exactly what you're talking about. It's in the lab that they're doing their computation and it's the TAs that are doing it. Um, and he uh, does a lot of TA training to make sure that the, the TAs are doing what they should. Um, oh, uh, Tony, you can go ahead and, and follow on that. Yeah, I just want to echo the same thing you are saying. Danny is actually taught uh, a, a computational, uh, I mean, taught introductory physics with computational integration when he was at uh, Georgia Tech. So he has experience teaching it as a, as a teaching assistant too. And now he's a professor at uh, Michigan State University. But Purdue University has also been doing that with uh, teaching assistants. And there are a number of classes that do that uh, using modern interactions curriculum. Okay, that's good to hear. Yeah, well, one, one thing I want to echo is that uh, we try to, um, I hope you're, you're uh, okay with all the information we've solicited from you to date, and, we, and there will be a few more before the workshop actually comes around, because we really try to tailor things to to fit what you're all interested in. And even this meeting here gives us a good idea of, of where to focus. So I think uh, everybody who participated last year would agree that all of these things will be discussed in pretty good detail this summer at River Falls. Couple hands going up here. Who? Uh, Lejeune, am I pronouncing that correctly? Yeah, it is correct. Yeah, go ahead. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Lejeune. I teach in Georgia Gwinnett College. Um, and my question is, I have never used Python myself. Um, I, I did Fortran and C uh, in my PhD work. So if I, if I try to learn it now, do you think I can do something uh, like during a workshop? <laughs> <laughs> You're getting two thumbs up from Michelle there, Lejeune. Yes. Well, I think that people were at the workshop who had never programmed in Python before, and they definitely were able to accomplish something, even just arriving at the workshop and being like, oh, everyone wants to use Python but me. Maybe I should try this out. And they were able to create something. It doesn't mean that they went back and implemented it in their classes like three weeks later, but I think that um 
you can definitely pick it up. And I think that Fortran and Python are similar with um, if you if you use arrays specifically. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, can you give me some uh, suggestions, like how to like which book to start with, or which other res resources you you think I should. For, for specifically for Python, right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, Larry, would you recommend Mark Newman's book? Uh, well, you're muted. You're muted, young man. Okay, now I'm muted? Okay. Yeah, we can hear you now. Okay, so are you talking about for teaching yourself or teaching uh, in a computational context or for a introductory course? Teaching myself Python language. Okay. Um, yeah, for yourself, you might also, um, it, Ruben Landau's book is freely available um, on Compadre. Um, we can send you a link for that, but that's a, a it's rather advanced for students uh, mathematically, um, but is, is not, uh, you know, you'd be fine with it. Um, and you could learn Python, uh, but yeah, there, and Mark Newman's book, you could use, uh, it's, it's rather verbose. I think it's, it's a little lengthy to assign to students, but um, there's lots of, lots and lots of good things. Oh, there's some links showing up in the chat window right now. Yeah. Uh, oh, Hunter's suggesting uh, Hour of Python. Um, Tony, did you wanna, uh, still interested in, in sharing something? Yes, I, I am. Uh, I just wanted to say that uh, for someone who's done C and Fortran, Python is a piece of cake. I'm one of the worst programmers in the entire universe, but I did learn some Python. <laughs> so yeah, you're, you're, you're pretty okay. I mean, uh, I, still, I still struggle with coding, uh, but I still teach it, you know? Okay, all right, thank you. We, we, we should be sure to, to make clear that you're not required to use Python or any other specific language. You, know, you should use whatever you want to use. At the same time, if there's something that you want to learn, by all means, we encourage you to go ahead and learn something, uh, something new. Um, and we will provide support to help you learn new things. Yeah. We, we have uh, amongst the uh, pickup, amongst the staff we're going to have at the uh, workshop, there will be <clears throat> sufficient expertise for impromptu tutorials on just about anything. So. And by the way, in, in case I haven't made it clear, we're only 14 miles away from Ellsworth. Wisconsin, which happens to be the cheese capital of Wisconsin. No, cheese curd capital of Wisconsin. They, they, yeah, that, they, that's the claim anyway. Fresh and squeaky. And good milkshakes. Oh, yeah. You won't eat for three days if you have one of those. I, I didn't mean to uh, derail things with cheese curds and milkshakes, by the way. So... <laughs> Uh, Lejeune, did that take care of your of your uh, question? You're still muted there. Yes, there you thank you. Okay, yeah. So, and, and and you know, if you look into any of these, if you have further questions, uh, you know, feel free to contact us or or uh, in anybody here. Uh, uh, okay. Also, have you, you know, there. I think Larry mentioned it. There's also the Slack channel that you've all been invited to. Okay. So take advantage of that coming up to the workshop also. And, okay. with, and within the Slack pickup team, there are channels uh, specifically for, um, for example, uh, Python, GlowScript, Jupyter Notebooks that are all sort of within the Python family, um, as well as different languages, as well as different um, content areas of physics. Um, so you can post questions or comments in there and start discussions there. Right. Okay. Thank you. So if you. Yeah. If you start playing with Python and Google doesn't answer it for you, go to the Slack channel. Somebody will get to you. Right. Okay. Will, did you want to jump in? Uh, yeah. I just wanted to um, kind of to ask if, if anyone knew about or, or if you did what you thought about 
Uh, Rhett Allen, um, he writes at Wired. He is uh, pretty prolific with writing trinket uh, code to analyze uh, simple situations in the introductory physics um, area. Uh, he's also really good about using uh, video analysis to, to also augment some of the analysis that he does for um, his blog. Uh, and so it's a really good place to see how some of this could be used in an introductory class. The nice thing about Trinket, of course, is that you can play with the code a little bit uh, right there in the browser. So what do you all think about the work, work that Rhett does? And um, Uh, using that in courses as well. Did, did everybody get the name? That, uh, uh, Will, can you say, what was the name? There's a, Hunter put a link there. I believe there's a link now. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Um, Rhett Allen? Gotcha. You were kind of coming yeah, in and out of it. Yeah, that, that guy. Yeah, my internet's not so good, I guess. Yeah, no, yeah, but, but just just toward the end there, it's okay. Uh, is anybody familiar? I I I am not. So. Yeah, he should totally be a pickupper. I've landed on his site many a time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, he, I've uh, I've seen his work. Oh, sorry. Who's that? He's a natural. Mm hmm. Yeah, I've I've seen his uh, stuff with Trinket, and I I found it to be, you know, um, you know, good advocacy work about sort of exposing it to people. Um, I I don't think I I didn't see any situation where I thought that what he had done with Trinket was especially different from other things that I knew kind of from people within our community. Mm -hmm. um, so I see I see him mostly as um, kind of having found an, an advocacy niche. Yeah, I think on the blog, he's appealing to a general audience. So what he's posting there is for not a college student, right? right. Someone that's just interested in physics. And so I think that he, on the blog, appeals to that population extremely well. And I think he's a professor somewhere. <laughs> I know I, I think I recall reading his bio because I remember thinking this semester, oh, this summer I should email this guy <laughs> and see if he knows about pickup. So I looked up his page. Um, and so he very well in his class might implement things that would be really great for our resources, but those wouldn't be mm -hmm. the things that would be appropriate for the wired blog. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Will. we'll have to look into this. Email him, Will. <laughs> so just just um, for fun, I'll I'll just toss in that um, I have a video meeting if if I can get my video to work on <laughs> on Thursday this week with um, Elliot Hauser, the CEO of Trinket, and mm. with with three high school teachers that Elliot knows as being heavy. Uh, GlowScript users, GlowScript Trinket users, and um, they are uh, Frank Noskesi, um Byron Fillauer, and Sean Weatherf. No, no, no. Uh, I forget. I'm sorry. Um, but um, you know, uh, I guess I'll, I just wanted to say that um, that I'm that I'm in the midst of getting connected with was sort of the master high school physics teacher users um, and will be, you know, be able to bring some stuff back to the pickup community if there's any right. sort of special expertise that they have. And then also, I just wanted to assure everybody that, I, so I built a relationship with Elliot Hauser, the CEO of Trinket, mm -hmm. by, by um, putting in an NSF proposal together in March. And um, I've found him and the, and the CTO of Trinket, Brian Marks, very approachable and uh, very, very friendly. So th they've been very helpful and they, they want to, they want Trinket to be more widely used and more effectively used. And um, so I think, you know, you can reach out to them too. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Hunter. You'll have to keep us posted on all that. Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, is there any pressing thing that you would like to have addressed before we close here? It's a little after uh, nine central time, and we usually try to limit these to about an hour or so. Uh, does anybody want to add any closing comments? Well, I just wanted to hear something from Will, Newton, and David, all Scott. <laughs> Tony wants to hear something from you guys. <laughs> how can you how can you turn that man down, huh? I guess he can't. <clears throat> Hi, I'm uh, Will Newton. <clears throat> So I'm, I'm a professor at Texas A&M Commerce. Um, I'm uh, teaching uh, quantum uh, mechanics upper division class for the first time in the fall. So uh, mm -hmm. I, I'm teaching it very, you know, I'm, I'm going to be teaching it in a, a sort of studio physics style. And I also want to incorporate some computational projects in there. So, mm -hmm. so I'm going to be coming to the workshop with a couple of, of ideas for, for, uh, for things for the street. Good, we've got some stuff for you too. Well, I've, also, I've also, hearing you all talk, I've also feel somewhat inspired to think about uh, introducing some computational projects at the, uh, in our intro uh, mm. physics courses as well, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. I hadn't really considered mm -hmm. doing, but hearing you all talk, I kind of... Yeah. Yeah, well, good. I'm inspired to, to think about that. Good. David, would you like to say anything before we close tonight? Sure, I'll jump in briefly. <laughs> um, thanks for doing this. I'm looking forward to it. Um, Certainly. Um, we're, I teach at Simpson College in, in Iowa, and we're a two-person mm -hmm. program, a small program, graduating about two to six per year. And um, mm -hmm. I'm not don't have much background in computation. My uh, very new colleague does, and we'll be coming together. Good. And Good. Uh, we want to implement, ultimately, we realize it take a few years, you know, teaching physics or computation across the curriculum. So I'm going to be coming as a novice to Python and things like that. But our, our computer science department starts teaching programming with Python. Our math department has the mathematical platform. And so those are the two we're hoping to work with. I'm not sure how that's going to work together. Mm -hmm. um, so it, we're fresh and new to this, but I'm looking forward to it. And I just want to uh, say to Tony too, thanks for uh, inviting me in here. And I'm, I'm a North Dakota person myself, so mm -hmm. glad to meet you. And um, yeah, I, I went to a school in North Dakota State, so. Yeah, good. All right, well, good. It's good to uh, meet you all. Uh, we also are very much looking forward to uh, the workshop. And it's coming up two months or so away, right? No. All right. Well, uh, all, all of you, thanks a bunch. Uh, stay tuned. We'll be communicating more with you when it gets a little closer, uh, especially when it comes down to coordinating travel and everything. And if there's any questions or concerns about anything, you know where to find us, the gopickup.org that about us has all of our emails. And uh, uh, let's see. Um, uh, or there's also, I was going to say, there's also the Slack channel too, and that way you can get, you can interact with the broader, the broader uh, community. All right? Okay. Well, good. Let's let's uh, call it a night. It's nice to meet you all, and uh, don't be strangers to the Slack channel. All right? Great. Thanks a lot. Okay. We shall see you all soon. Good night. Good night, and please drive safely.